Good afternoon. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to The Conversation with Al McFarland. I'm glad to be here and glad to have you along as well. I have a great show today. I've got a friend, a colleague, a person that I have watched for, seems like a lifetime, I've admired forever. Uh, I admire him, his dad, his wife, his children, uh, the family, uh, the idea that they represent and the work that they bring into community and bring into the world. I'm talking about Melvin Carter Jr. And we'll talk about his book and a play uh, of his book that's currently running in St. Paul at the History Theater. Uh, first, I wanna ask you to join this work, support this program, The Conversation with Al McFarland by going over to uh, YouTube's In Insight News channel YouTube Insight News Channel. So you might be connecting right now either at Black Press USA on YouTube or at Insight News on YouTube. You could be connecting through Facebook. Uh, we've got a Facebook Insight Channel. There's also a Black Press USA Facebook channel. You could be connecting to us through LinkedIn. We appreciate your presence there. Or you could be getting this program live on Twitter. However you're getting it, we thank you. But we're going to ask you to do one thing to support our ability to, to capture the numbers and to grow the numbers. We want you to be a subscriber. How do you do that? Go over to Insight News on YouTube, the YouTube Insight News channel, and just click subscribe. It costs you nothing, uh, a second of your time, but it allows you to get notifications every time we go live with the program and allows us to know how many people are getting the show, sharing the show, and we want to grow the numbers. We're across the 300 number, we want to get to 1,000. Our next goal is to get 400, 500, and you can help us move in that direction right now today. Also, let people know. Tell your friends, tell you, your fam uh, that we're having important conversations over here at The Conversation with Al McFarland. We've got a history of bringing what we call robust conversations forward to the community. Yesterday, for example, we talked with uh, uh, Sister Green, Taisha Green, from the Minneapolis um, uh, program that's embroiled in controversy right now behind uh, a Black History Month event that... Uh, had projected getting 20,000 people to show up to support and learn about black business, black culture, but actually ended up with far fewer and a lot of blame going back and forth. The institution blaming uh, the uh, now resigned former director of the program, but she shooting back saying there's institutional structural failure of the city itself. And she named the mayor and the head of operations and uh, the president of city council and a city council member in particular as being obstructive and in a sense, laying the blame for the failure of their event at their feet. Well, that's what I call robust conversation. Her story hasn't been shared as fully as we did. That's what we do here. We want you to be supportive and engage in that kind of work. Well, we also start off every day with what we call hot topics. We've got a several to go into before I bring in my, my friend, Melvin Carter Jr. The first, uh, you can le read the story uh, at the uh, our website. Uh, it's a, a new piece that comes from Associated Press. Again, we've posted this story at insightnews.com and it's an important story. Uh, the story says the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, approves over-the-counter Narcan. And uh, just a couple of paragraphs, it says that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration on uh, Wednesday uh, approved the selling approved selling the leading version of naloxone. I think I'm saying that the right way. Naloxone without a prescription, setting the overdose reversing drug on course to become the first opioid treatment drug to be sold over the counter. It's a move that some advocates have long sought as a way to improve access to life saving to a life saving drug, though the exact impact will not be clear immediately. Here's what the issues involve. First of all, what is Narcan? Uh, the approved nasal spray from Gaithersburg, Maryland based emergent biosolutions is the best known form of naloxone. And I'll end with this. It says it can reverse overdoses of opioids, including street drugs such as heroin and fentanyl and prescription versions, including oxycodone. Well, why is this important? You know, the country, this community included, perhaps the world, uh, is awash in 
uh, illegal and dangerous opioid drugs. Uh, the opioid epidemic, it, uh, epidemic in this country, in this city, and elsewhere uh, is massive. And one of the things people have to do is learn about what can be done to help people when they are at risk of losing life with an overdose. Uh, a lot of stories have to do with people buying street drugs, thinking it's one thing, but finding that the drugs are laced with fentanyl. Fentanyl uh, is murderous. It'll kill you. Uh, one drop, one dose will kill you. And so, so it's important that we educate people about the dangers of opioids, but also educate people about how we can react to, respond to, and help save lives. And one of the strategies is uh, this naloxone uh, strategy, the nasal spray that can reverse the impact of uh, an even deadly dose of fentanyl or other opioids. So now that this is gonna be available more publicly over the counter, that's a good thing. Uh, how ordinary people will get to have it in their possession and be in a position to help others. We don't know that yet, but it's a step in the right direction. Let me know what you think about that. Uh, not only about the uh, uh, the prevalence of the opioid crisis. When I hear that, I think about Prince and fentanyl and others, uh, but also about this solution. One of the strategies to try to do interventions when people are in danger. So that's one. Let me go to the next uh, of our hot topics today. And that is uh, uh, making reference to the legendary black lawyer and lobbyist Randall Robinson. Again, this story uh, is in Insight News uh, at our website uh, today, posted today, March 29th. And uh, it says that Randall Robinson, the founding executive director of TransAfrica, whose lobbying efforts in the 1980s heavily influenced America's foreign policy towards South Africa's racist apartheid government, died earlier this week on the Caribbean island of St. Kitts. He's a native of Richmond, Virginia. In 41, he went to Norfolk State University, which is a historically black college university on a basketball scholarship. He graduated from Virginia Union uh, and later graduated from Harvard Law School, focused a legal career on social justice issues uh, and, uh, you know, really informed by his own experiences growing up in the Jim Crow South. One of the things uh, he was known for was his book, The Debt. Uh, he was also known because his brother, Max Robinson, was an ABC news anchor. And between the Robinson boys, they were arguably uh, one of the most influential black families in the country in the 1980s. My personal Randall Robinson story is that he was our guest on this program, uh, the predecessor of it. We call this the Public Policy Forum at Lucille's Kitchen way back in the uh, 80s and 90s, I think, 90s. And he was our guest talking about his book, The Debt, and the power of the presentation we had with him included the fact that we had sent our own editor, Brant Williams, uh, to Germany to interview survivors of the Holocaust who were pursuing reparations from the German government for the theft of life, of property, and of liberty uh, as uh, because it occurred as official policy of the state under the Nazi regime. We drew the parallel, he draws the parallel, the theft of life, property, freedom, liberty for black people was a state controlled function in the United States of America. Slavery was part of our governance structure. And therefore, this government owes black people the enslaved reparations just as Germany owed reparations to Jews. Great conversation, a great program. We'll read about it at insightnews.com. And if you haven't done it yet or need to refresh, go get the debt. Uh, it's a powerful book. It explains uh, this relationship and the financial side of the relationship between the enslaved, our people, black people, and uh, the West in, in general, United States in particular. Uh, the final hot topic I'm going to do today is called Delayed Not Denied, and it's an article about a Vietnam veteran, Colonel 
Paris Davis finally receiving a Medal of Honor. Uh, Colonel Paris Davis, who was a U.S. Army retired uh, officer, was awarded the Medal of Honor on Friday, March 3rd, 2023 at the White House. He was presented the award by President Joe Biden. Uh, the 83-year-old former Green Beret was finally honored for his action in Ben Dinh Province, South Vietnam, on June 18th, 1965. The award came more than half a century after Davis risked his life to save some of his men by fighting off the North Vietnamese. This belated recognition came after the recommendation for his medal was lost, was resubmitted, then lost again. And then finally in 2016, advocates for Davis's award recreated and resubmitted the paperwork. Finally, uh, Joe Biden told him, uh, you are everything this medal means. You are everything our nation is at our best. Brave, big-hearted, determined, and devoted, selfless, and steadfast. Well, kudos to uh, Brother uh, U.S. Army Colonel Paris Davis and you know the countless other men and women who served this country, often uh, without recognition, without praise, and often without properly benefiting from the things they should benefit from uh, after they have served the country, like the GI Bill, like business loans, like home mortgages and other things. Well, a lot of stuff to think about. You know, I, I, before I go to the last part of the program, I, I want to, again, as yesterday, uh, sort of say a word of condolence and regret and sorrow reflecting uh, those uh, people killed in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, a shooter uh, who had mental uh, challenges, uh, possessing some seven guns, entered a school, a parochial school, with three weapons, uh, two assault rifle type and one pistol, and shot and killed three peop six people, uh, three children, and three adults. So our prayers and thoughts and condolences go out to all of them. And we raise the question, when and how will we as a country uh, deal with the question of the availability of guns and the um, destruction that uh, the use of guns has meant on citizens in community? Uh, the final thing is I want to also uh, say kudos to people in Minnesota and anywhere else who've responded to the crisis that came from the climate event in Mississippi the tornadoes that destroyed um, uh, whole towns and left lots of people without shelter uh, and without water. And a number of people here in Twin Cities and others have uh, rallied to provide support, either financial or material, and some volunteer support. Thank you for doing that. But I invite and encourage all of us to pay attention to connect. And if we have a re relative relationship uh, in Mississippi, Now's the time to reach out and be supportive to help any way we can. Well, with that, let me bring my guest in today, and that's Melvin Carter, Jr. Uh, Brother Melvin Carter, uh, good to see you. Welcome to the conversation with Al McFarland. How you doing, man? I'm good to see. I'm doing good, man. You're looking good. You been you been in that gym? Not yet. I need to go. I'm you look I, like but, you've been doing some spring training. Well, you you you're reading my mind. It's time to get back. I, I've been suffering from the COVID, COVID twenty and the COVID forty. Yeah, and yeah. the problem is sitting here all day, every day, and uh, you know being sedentary and eating a lot of food. So I am due for well, the you're looking gym. Better, you're looking better than you're claiming. Uh -huh. Well, thank you, thank you. All right, we'll, we're going to do that though. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because uh, I like. Uh, talking about the need for us to pay attention to our bodies, to our physical health and our mental health. We talk about that all the time. And mm -hmm. it's particularly important for Black men to focus mm -hmm. on being healthy and getting to the gym, getting moving and uh, keeping our minds tuned up. All of it adds up to being healthy, uh, hopefully wealthy and wise. And That's eat the them greens, the man. You gotta eat them greens, man. Greens, okay. All right. I think once you told me too to also eat some, uh, what did you tell me? Uh, once way back when, uh, pumpkin seeds. Yeah, <laughs> baby, you gotta get that zinc, man. <laughs> you remember Not telling me that? <laughs> where, where men, all men have a zinc shortage, you know? Uh -huh. And uh, and 
uh, one of my one of my uh, chemist friends said it helps put keep the lead in the pencil. Yeah, <laughs> that's what you told me. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, but well, they have fossil uh, water off the cold. You know, I, I had COVID for about three days, man. I started popping my zinc um, pills, and man, uh, up in, in, in about three four days, I was up tap dancing. Ah, uh, okay. But, well, tap dance is an overstatement, but you know. But you came through it. Came mm -hmm. through it strong. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk, let's talk about uh, a lot of stuff. I mean, I got a lot of stuff to talk. I, I enjoy being with you, man. Just hanging out and talking. I enjoy the work that you've uh, provided and leadership that you provided as a mentor. You are a retired police officer, number one. Recovering. Uh, and, re <laughs> say it again. Recovering. A recovering police officer. That's interesting. We'll talk about that. But you also are, are the epitome of this idea of a son, son of Rondo. Uh, your family is generations deep in Rondo community. Yes, I want to talk about that. So I'm interested in talking about your story personally uh, and how you see yourself and saw yourself coming into the world and how you've captured that in two places. One, the book, Diesel Heart, and two, now the play, uh, based on the book, a play that's being presented right now at History Theater. I think people got to about April, someday in April. We'll get Saturday, date. April 2nd. April 2nd. So you got a couple and of days to, April to get to it and see it. Okay. All right. All right. So then, uh, so let's start with, uh, uh, you know, the Melvin Carter Jr. story and Diesel Heart. Let's talk about the book first, and the play first, then the book. And then talk about you. So talk about the play at the History Theater. And in talking about it, invite people to show up, buy some tickets, and enjoy. Sure, buy some tickets. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Do it. <laughs> but you know what's it, what's important to me? What's most me? There's a lot of most meaningful um, events in the story. One that's very definitive is when I'm standing in front of my mama's daddy's mama's mama, who was once was born enslaved. And this is really a factual thing. And every, back in the early 50s, every year, they'd have a family reunion to say goodbye to her. But she lived till like 1967, you know. But I met her, and she and I kind of merged in a way that's that's mystical. It doesn't make any sense, you know. But we, but the, the, the great grandkids were all being paraded before her. And um, there was no words, you know, but, but I could sense that she was from some space and time that was beyond my comprehension. And I can feel her probing me and realizing that she would be denied the future that I'd be allowed to see. And we merged in a way that um, the disconnect was the connect, you know? I mean, it's, it, you know, it doesn't make any sense, but I seem to be supercharged with a mission in that sense, you know? And so she, at the time of, of that happened, it was in a sharecropping environment. Mm -hmm. and, and she was there when uh, during the first June nineteenth, Juneteenth, you know, mm -hmm. and so and so on and on. So I came back to Minnesota. So so well, let's, let's talk about her first. I, I, I'm interested in talking about what was Claire her name, Ray. where Claire was Ray. she born, and what was her 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 origin story, as much as you know. As much as I know that she's my mama's daddy's mama's mama, down mm -hmm. in Waco, Texas. Okay, and, and you know, and and see, you know, that generation they had a way of just taking the oxygen out of stories because there's so much in there that they don't want you to know. And they don't want you to know for various reasons. But but in the context, a whole lot of precious history is lost. You know, because everybody's got a great story. Everybody's yeah. got a great story. And everybody can tell their story. I know a lot of people who have greater stories than mine and are greater storytellers and better writers than mine. They just haven't, you know, brought it forth. But Texas, you know, uh, was kind of the cesspool of lynching, you know? And so um, that's another thing that comes into uh, play on my daddy's side of the family, because they, they got up out of Texas, brother, when in 1916, uh, in Paris, Texas, when, as the story I was handed to me, was that the whole town burnt down and nobody knew the reason, you know? But that's so, that's such an incredible story in itself. Brian Grandison wants to do something right just on that because in, the late 1800s, uh, a, a man named Henry Smith was brutally, savagely, cruelly executed and tortured to death. And my grandfather witnessed that. And he was always haunted by that, you know? And, and we knew that. But, but 20 years later, 
bear with me now. This is going, <laughs> you know, this is something that Brian Grandison, he's a historian, kind of came brought together, you know, because when 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 I when it came to pass that there's a mystery involved, uh, Brian Brian's in, you know, so he, he got to do some research and come to find out that the there's a there's a uh, article up here someplace that he dug up that indicated that the blacks that fled to Minnesota were responsible for that lynching. I mean, sorry, for that fire, right? And guess whose houses were targeted during that fire? They knew who did the lynching and they knew where they lived. I can't hear you, man, unmute, you, unmute yourself. So those houses burned. Yeah, something like that. And and so 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 the mystery is what it is, you know. I mean, so 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 they had a, a way of just take, you know, because okay, the whole town burned down and 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 Papa had to hitch up the mules and get out of town fast, and Uncle Max set sent for us. What? I mean, I mean <laughs> that's it, you know. And, and and then after they dead and gone, you know, you're like, man. But 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 what is interesting, you know the Zachary family? Yeah. Their family came up in the same situation. Okay. And it sounded like either a Carter started that fire or Zachary did. <laughs> <laughs> but but e either it. way, the fire was real. Yeah, the fire was real. And um and uh nobody knows for sure what happened, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the end of that. But but I always felt like my life was about something. I always felt people praying for me. I knew that my life was bigger than I am. You know, I, I always had a, a some kind of, uh, and I use the word, well, blessing on my life, you know. Mm -hmm. I always had some kind of uh, protection that uh, wasn't necessarily logical by by natural standards. You know, I seemed like I had some super on my natural, you know what I'm saying? And, and so, I mean, I've survived stuff that doesn't make sense. A lot of people read the book, say that, they had to hurry up and finish reading the book before I died, before I got killed, you know. My mama used to say I had a death wish. And she always cried, I come in the house at night and my mama will have called the police department, the emergency rooms, all of them in the, in the city, and even the morgue looking for me. And I come in with some more crap, you know, you know whatever it is, you know, kids come in with, and so, um, but my dad was, and my, and they thought I was on drugs. I, was, I, 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 really, I, I dabbled with some marijuana, but that's about it, you know. My, to my dad, that was kind of drugs enough. But my, my, my dad said, "Honey, the boy ain't on drugs. The boy just ain't got no sense. The boy just ain't got no sense." My, and so the whole play evolves around me <laughs> trying to act like some good sense, trying to do because I had my issues. L, I had severe issues, brother. You know, you, you know, we talk about ADD, ADHD, ABCD. I had the entire alphabets. Brother, I had more issues than Time and Life magazines, you know, and and thoughts galore. You know, I was I was what they call a problem child, and I had severe anger issues. And and my dad would say, "Boy, you want me to take that fist and put it upside your head, your boy? Put that fist upside my head." And then I I get the point, you know. Sunday, I see what they were trying to tell me, you know. And so life goes on. Um, I'm kind of rattling. What what do you? I mean, so. I mean, there's there's so much in this story, and suddenly, suddenly, somehow, after being arrested at gunpoint, being shot at by the police, and and being arrested at gunpoint in like Chicago and uh, Atlanta, and even in the military, somehow I had a record that was clean enough to get me on the police department. And my friends thought, man, you're going to join the oppressor, man. What happened to all that revolutionary talk? You know. Now I'm thinking about. Uh, changing the thing from within, and so that was a complete turnaround. And then I had some uh, double homicides, some homicides in my family that that I, I you know, I, I'm still gutted from. You know? mm. So I'm gonna stop right now and see if I'm getting off track or something. Because I no, uh, we're free to go wherever the, wherever the spirit leads in this conversation is cool, you know. Uh, and I think mm -hmm. anything that we can share and say uh, is cool to say and bring up. And so. Uh, and um, you, know, I was thinking this as you were talking about your grandmother. You sparked with me something that I've done before. I'm going to do this now. And uh, your your great grandmother, your 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 grandmother's mother's mother, right? Or your my, my, mother, my mama's daddy's mama's mama. Yeah. Okay. 
And and when was she born? Likely, roughly. I I, I guess I I mean we I guess the speculation would be like the 18, early eighteen fifty nine or sixty. I guess I'll take a stab at eighteen sixty. Sixty, and so she lived until what nineteen what sixty seven. Okay, so she was over hundred years old. That's what is that's what the speculation is. Yeah. You know, there was no there was no documentation yeah. of her birth. Yeah, I have this uh, <laughs> photograph. I'm going to try to put it up here to show. And this is a picture of of uh, me sitting in the middle, cross legged, and <laughs> all my first cousins. Right. Uh -huh. So behind me is Big Mama. My Big mama, mama, my mother's mother, and to her left uh, is the owner of the house, Mrs. Powell, and Mr. Powell, and my cousin Tiola, baby sister. To mm -hmm. her right is her mother. Her mother is Lizzie, uh, Lizzie Harrison, and to the right of Lizzie is my mother, uh, Maxine McFarland, and the brother I think under me, who's Raymond. So the point of this photograph and sharing this is that. I recognize, I met Lizzie first when maybe this year or year before this, I went down south to Sunflower, mm -hmm. Mississippi and uh, stayed maybe a week or so at the family farm. They were sharecroppers. Mm -hmm. And uh, once I was sticking my hand into a barrel of fluffy, white, beautiful cotton, and she mm -hmm. had a wooden spoon crack me across my knuckles and said, boy, don't put your hand in that cotton. Could be a snake in there, right? So mm -hmm. I remember her correcting me as a child and she came to, Min to Kansas City where she lived till she died. Well, mm -hmm. the point of the story is I went to see 12 Years a Slave, mm -hmm. came back home, and this photograph I showed you has been on this mantle right behind me here for 30, 40, 50 years, right? Mm -hmm. and I just took it for granted, never studied it. And mm -hmm. I got back and I looked up and almost like the picture was glowing, uh, Brother Melvin. Mm -hmm. And I got up and looked at it and started thinking, this great grandmother, my grandmother's mother was born in 1860. She mm. was born the property of another human being. Mm. Mm. And that's your experience when you said you knew your, 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 your great, 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 great grandma. That's a gift. Mm. That's a, the connection that you have with her the privilege. beyond the disconnect is the same one that I have. Your story touches me personally because I sat and was hugged by a person and talked to by a person, held by a person who had been born, owned by other human beings. And it that makes me mad. mad. That it makes me mad. mad. I'm still but, mad. But you know, man, you know, you, you know, with the snake under the house, did you, you remember those, those uh, shotgun houses? Yeah. I remember, I thought, cause, cause I'm from Minnesota, all the houses up here has basement. And I thought it was so cool that you could crawl under, from in from one knee underneath it and come out the other end. That was so <laughs> no, man. I don't know, well, I, realized, I, didn't, I didn't realize they had snakes and scorpions and spiders down there, man. Cause you know, kids, boys are dumb, man. All boys are dumb. Well, the house I stayed in, uh, when they had a, 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 a small bed in the, in the living room. It seemed like it was like a one or two room house. I can't remember, I'm like four years old. Mm -hmm. But I remember laying in bed and looking at the stars through the roof. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's number one. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know what it did when it rained, but I know I could lay in bed and see the stars. That's what I do know. Secondly, this house had slats like diagonal across the floor mm -hmm. and had like barrels on right. the four corners, right? So the slats were not tongue and groove. They were just set beside each other and a one inch space between the slats or half inch sl slat and geese were under the house. And they geese? said, put your shoes on, geese. Uh, put your shoes on because the geese will come and snap your toes Man. through the floor. Yikes. That was amazing, right? That's amazing. It uh, was amazing. I, 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 remember going, I remember going to one of my houses, man. First of all, you had to go across the dirt road to the well and throw the bucket down in the well and do this stuff. Why we get the, we get the water out? You know? And then they had a piano that was right in the room as you walked in. And you play the piano, and all kinds of insects would fly out from behind them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that was country. The place was so country. It was in a place called Shilton, Texas, visiting mm -hmm. my mother's relatives during that same trip. And um, it was, it's such a country place that the people that lived there, I went back this instant to, to try to show me where that place was. They couldn't even find it, you know. Uh, yeah. And, so we, yeah, my, we, my family lived in Sunflower, Mississippi, man. And the place was called the Quiver River. Uh, it was mm -hmm. on the 
uh, went through the town. There's stories about that. Well, you know, just knowing this about your family is really a gift, as I say. Let me pull up this picture here. Uh, Vosh, put this picture on the screen. Let me ask Brother Melvin to talk about this picture. I love this picture, too, Brother Melvin, because I'm a Navy man, too. I was in the mm -hmm. Navy. I served on the destroyer in 1966 uh, and 7, 68, uh, mm -hmm. based in Mayport, Florida. And mm -hmm. when I saw this picture of you promoting your play, Diesel Heart, I said, this has got to be a great front page picture for uh, Insight News and the story. We're going to do it with Brother Melvin. Uh, tell me, tell me when you settled there, tell me about this, uh, this picture. I had to move because my my, my battery wasn't recharged, so I figured I figured that it's better that I move than to let okay. that. Run out. Okay. But, but it's funny because that that was a picture they give you in boot camp, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just and it was just black and white. I always hated that. Oh, that's always been my least favorite picture of myself, until the the history theater went and put some color to it because it was black and white, and then and then it you know it gave me some dimension, you know, and so it just befuddles me that of all the pictures that exist to me. That's the one that they they got on the building. You know, it's, it's, it's a great picture. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. And, and it, it again, I related because it reminded me of me, probably at age eighteen. How how old were you then? I was nineteen. Okay, yeah, so same age as kind of. So talk about Diesel Heart now. Tell me about the uh, the book uh, and what you said in the book and what you wanted to convey, and then talk about how that book through the uh, collaboration uh, became a play that's being presented now at the History Theater. Uh, what was the reason for the book, first of all? Where does the name Diesel Heart come from? Well, I always felt I lived the story because, you know, you keep surviving when people, other people don't. You know, I, I mean, I had a thing for uh, just being in some of the worst of things and, and still I survived and, and survived kind of flamboyantly, you know, in ways that were beyond my ability. They had nothing to do with my intellect or savvy or anything but by virtue of, of God's blessing. I have to say it that way. Um, so I so I knew that history was watching me. And I and I knew that uh, I, my life meant something. And so you know and then you go, why, why, why? You know, how mm -hmm. I don't even know what the question is. And then I presume that maybe was, I went through all that to, to share, you know. And, and and at the very end of the book, I hope I don't hope it doesn't spoil it for anybody that the very last sentence I, I let the audience know, man, this is a testimony. You know, this is a testimony that that life is worth living and mm. prayer is worth praying and effort is worth uh life is worth living and 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 that struggle is a part of life, you know. And what what you can't do is give up. But the thing is, when you see the play. You know, I you know, you know, I hate to brag. You know that, right? Go ahead. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I had this gift of 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 of, of, of dropping some drops of some some fisticuffs. You know, it was a it was a natural gift. You know, I could have been a contender, and mm -hmm. as I was in the Navy, I wound up embarrassing the wrong people. You know, it, you know, in in the most hostile workplace environment. And um, what what you mean by that? To break that down. Well, let me say this. I was I was undefeated in inter international military competition. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Were you and fighting what welterweight? What were you welterweight? I was welterweight, but everything was a grudge match, and everything was race laced based, you know, and everything was Marines versus um, uh, sailors, and so I always have to give away uh, some height and some size and some weight to get some competition. Mm. And, so, and so when you look at the picture of the book, do you have a picture? Let me get it. No, no, don't, don't, don't leave. Don't leave. Okay. Okay. Oh, you got it. Okay, go ahead. You see me standing over. Well, you, let me see. You, you see. Yeah, you see, got it. Got it. Okay. You know, you see three men in the ring. Uh-huh. There's a referee, two are boxers, one's standing up, one's on the mat. You standing. That's me standing. And 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 right after I dropped him, the captain who I, I had who I had act, Accidentally humiliated, inadvertently, unintentionally. I just do my thing. He came over and he said to me, "That's the champion of the country." <laughs> he just back from he just back from the Olympics, you know, and and, and they didn't tell me that, you know. And you until, defeated him. You you had him well, laid out. Well, mm -hmm. I I say I claim to be undefeated, but I had a number of of draws, you know. Mm -hmm. so, so they call that fight a tie. Okay. You know because but I didn't go down. 
you know, and he, but but he came, you know, in, in boxing, we had this saying about taking your opponent out in the deep water and drowning him, you know, you know, well, this fight, this knockdown was early in the, in the bout. Mm. This, when I dropped him, you know, I think I'm thinking when I'm dominating you now, because yeah. I, man, this cat got up and took me out in the deep water and liked to drown me, man. You know, he, he cleaned my, he cleaned my clock in about the second round and in the, about the, I mean, he had me running. He, he kind of took me out there and um, I, I was able to stage to come back in the final round and they call it a draw. Mm. I, I didn't have a killer instinct. You know, I very okay. deliberately never knocked anybody out because mm. destroying a human being just for recreation just was something I just couldn't bring myself to do. Once I saw my opponent was um, defeated, um, I, I let it go to the referees. I let, mm. I let it go to the judges, you know, but but in, in real heated fisticuffs, you know, I, I had no problem bringing about some injuries to an attacker. Mm hmm. Uh, so anyway, but 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 the play starts. So I was fighting the heavyweight. I had to give. I gave bef fight before this one. I had given my opponent like fifty pounds. I lied to say I was one hundred and sixty-five, but I really wasn't wasn't quite one hundred and fifty. I wasn't quite a buck fifty, and he was all at two hundred. Mm. Yeah, bully, and he lied and said he weighed one hundred and eighty-five, and so right. go closer. And so the play starts out with this cat catch me with a a, a, a left, a right, and a hook. You know, and <laughs> I mean, brother, you know, I mean, he knocked me into a different space and time. And, uh, and I had to go, I had to drop deep down into into the heart and come up with something because, you know, everybody's got a, thinks they got a best until you get thrown in that hurricane and had to thread water with circling sharks. Did you, then you, if whatever you thought was your best, you got to come up with a better best, you know? Mm. And so that's what this kind of what my life has been about. But I want to answer your question, okay? I'm going to take a breath because I get myself all worked up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you see that dumb picture of me that I hated that you just flashed up here in the Navy? Mm -hmm. It was I was just inducted into the military, and, and you know how, how they get this mass production physical, and everybody's standing right. in that kitchen. I mean, there's like hundreds and hundreds of men standing around, and right. the doctors going around with stethoscopes and, 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 and flashlights and popsicle sticks. Yep. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> and clipboards, you know, and so they just go one and, and they, they and so they hit you and then they move on. Well, all of a sudden, the stethoscope just bam hits my chest. The doctor looks, you know, and he calls, he calls the other doctor over there, doesn't hit my chest. And, and hey, and, and so pretty soon they're having some doctor medical uh, conversation that's above my pay grade. And uh, pretty soon, and so they moved on. So out of all, all the hundreds of men that was there, they never stopped anybody else's chest but mine. And then one of the doctors said, you know, they got to talk down to you. He said, well, that's by the heart you got there, son. You know, mm. got to come in. So anyway, I said, what do you mean? And so they, so anyway, the final conclusion was that is something wrong. Is that bad? The final conclusion was, no, they said that, it, that my heart sounded like a diesel engine in a Mustang body. Wow. You see what I'm saying? You know, because because it's a story. This story is a story about heart, mm -hmm. and, and more so than anything, it's a spiritual story. Is because I, in the story, I eliminate the possibility that it's a story about intellect. Mm -hmm. I eliminate the the possibility that it's a story about opportunity. I eliminate the possibility that's a story about um, excellence. You know, this is it's a clumsy. Stupid kid, mm. you, you know. When I see that picture that did you just hung up, the Navy yeah. nineteen, you know what's scary about him? You know what scares Come. me? My whole future is in his hands, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, all the stuff that I've been able to accomplish and build around people around me is in that guy's hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's weighty. That's weighty. That's weighty. So diesel, the name diesel heart comes from that physical exam where they were marveling at the power, at the mm -hmm. clarity, the, the pulse, pulsation of your heart. They probably hadn't heard something or they'd heard uh, hearts like this before enough to identify yours as one mm -hmm. of the unique and rare. Mm, it's about internal combustion. You know? It's about mm -hmm. internal fortitude and, and it's coming up with that intangible wherewithal that you need in the worst and worst of times. Mm -hmm. And so um, 
I want I want youth to know that they have that and they have they have they have a precious story. And mm -hmm. talks about, you know, talks about I, I admit some stuff that I'm not proud of. I'm ashamed of having broken into a house with my buddies. You know, I'm mm -hmm. ashamed of that. But I want them to know that I'm I'm I share some things that that I was I was just I'm just embarrassed about you know, mm -hmm. that that I had to, I had to repeat second and third grade back to back. Mm -hmm. No, nobody does that, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I don't know anybody, you know. Yeah. But also, I want people to know that my mother, you know, she was the only one that that um, knew that I wasn't. As they say, they test they were testing me for considering me for being retarded. Mm -hmm. My mama was the only person who knew that I had something up here, you know, that, mm -hmm. that needed to be discovered. You know, it's like mining for gold when you when you're trying to get into somebody's um, in life and, and let them know and find out what's with where their power is. And, mm -hmm. and, and and another thing that happened when I when, when I got caught with that combination on the heavyweight, you know, that's that's the symbolic of everybody in your life at some point you're gonna get hit with something. Yep. You're gonna get hit with something. It could be some bad news, it could be a loss of per persons, you know, like like my family, you know, we've had some some horrific homicides and stuff like that. We've been victimized by that. Mm -hmm. And then you got to go in your heart and see what you got. Mm -hmm. At the resort in that in the, in that internal combustion, you know, in that internal fortitude, and de and determine my life is still worth living. We have so many of us you know, have survival guilt, like I do. I mean, that among so many other things, and we have to process through that, and we have to determine what we want to do and how we want to. Do that. You did uh, most of your military uh, duty tour in Morocco, North Africa, right? That's correct. Talk about that. What was that like? How were you as a 19 year old or 20 year old experiencing being in Africa broadly, though some might say that Morocco doesn't doesn't see itself as Africa. Uh, <laughs> maybe it does, but I wonder what was mm. your experience being in the Navy and being in Morocco? Well, first of all, I was excited to go to the motherland, you know, to the motherland. And I got a chance to people to, to interact with people who really consider themselves of uh, African, you know, mm -hmm. but also uh, it was infinitely better than Vietnam. Mm -hmm. It was infinitely better than combat, you know, which I wasn't above, but I mean, I had to process, well, I mean, I'm not above protecting my territory, you know, my house, mm -hmm. my city, my state. And if I thought, I mean, give me, give me some reason to be mad at the enemy, convince me that we're battle. I mean, or scared of the enemy. Convince You'll me that. Fight. You'll join the fight. Yeah, convince me that there's something, uh, you know, because going and killing somebody and getting killed is a serious thing. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so, right. and so that that was so much better. But you got. But the thing I would say was it was 1960, um, like 20 years after Truman had um, um, integrated the military forces. And I think the Navy did the worst job out of the Marine Corps, Air Force, um, Army, all, uh, all of them in, in integrating in ways mm -hmm. that were um, okay for the for those of us, you know. And and the Army, the Navy did a real wonderful job otherizing me, you know. And so, if, you know, so I had one friend. God sent me one friend. And his name was Bill Huff, and he and because of our friendship, you know, I kind of talked to him into moving to Minnesota. He was from New Camden, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. He was kind of, he's kind of a, 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 an adopted big brother for me. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but that, but I uh, had some experience. So that I, I kind of um, don't want to talk about too much, you know, because, okay. but I did, I did, I did get uh, some, well, of course, you know what captain's mask is. Yeah, I do. I had me some. I had me a, some of them. You know, okay, I, had, I had one. I had one, two. Oh, you only got one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> and, and the captain Carter. I don't want to see you again no more. And, and <laughs> next, next time he said, Carter, I told you I didn't want to see you again. You know, it's kind of, for those of you who don't, don't know, it's a trial for, mm -hmm. for having disobeyed yeah. or or for having punched the officer in the face. Yeah, yeah. I told you offline before that when I was in the Navy, uh, I was on a ship that was stationed in Mayport, Florida, that uh, did a couple of Caribbean cruises and 
the big thing was the Mediterranean cruise. That was big. I and mean, I figured I'm uh, uh, Brother Melvin, uh, 18 years old, and I'm in Spain and Italy and, and Greece. Uh, and I got a pocket full of money and my mama and daddy ain't around, <laughs> you know. And so what do you do? What do you do? When you are 18, you got a, a whole bunch of money to you, a whole bunch of money, right? And and no mama, no daddy, right? You do, uh, you, have, you have fun. So, but the story I tell people about that being Vietnam era, I was active duty from 66 to 68. Mm -hmm. That was the Vietnam era. In fact, the ship that I was on after I got off got shipped to uh, assigned, deployed to Vietnam. I never went there. So I tell people the only fighting I did in the Navy was fighting white boys on my ship because mm -hmm. whenever we pulled into a town, like uh, it could have been uh, uh, the port of Malta or uh, the Crete or Piraeus in Athens, Greece, mm -hmm. After two or three beers, and white boys get sloppy drunk mm. and they feel at liberty to call us a bunch of N-words, right? And expect us to go on along with it. Seven mm. black people on my ship out of 300, uh, mm. with a compliment. And we kind of had a pet. The minute they say it, fight. And mm. so before the NIG could be fully formed and said, <laughs> somebody was getting busted upside their head. And all mm. of us knew what the drill was, and everybody jumped in and piled on. And mm. we had a bunch of fights, both on on the beach. We had fights. Uh, we, we had epic fights mm. in in Malta, uh, also in Crete, uh, on the boat between the shore and the ship. Fights, fights on the ship itself. Mm. So that's the battle I did fighting white people who felt they had uh, the opportunity or the authority to mm. otherize me and mm. to demean and devalue me. That's my story about the military. Well, you know, I mean, I can relate to that because, because, because my, I told you I kind of quit with the, with the, with the fist of course, and my idea was to not let them get to the second syllable. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, something happened. Something happened sometimes, you know. And 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 on one, on one occasion, um, they were making fun of this. You know, we were in the enlistments club, and this young lady, I liked her, friendly like, you know, and I respected her, but but she wasn't real attractive, you know. And she would kind of you know, kind of skinny, and 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 she was dancing on the dance floor by herself, and some some sailors across the dance floor were, were making ape sounds, you know, and which I took personally, and I didn't want them to hurt her feelings, mm -hmm. and so I I, I kind of surreptitiously walked over to them and told them, man, you guys, um, whatever I said, I don't know what I said, but I I challenged mm -hmm. them, you can't make fun of her, don't make fun of her, and mm -hmm. and and one guy needed to get two that first syllable mm -hmm. and, and a big old backhand came out and, 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 and caught him in such a way that, that I never, I don't know where it came from, but it, it he was, you know, he was on the floor flopping around like a crappie on the bottom of a boat, you know, yep. <laughs> and, and, yep. and, and everybody said, give me some air, give me some and, and man, oh my God, I, I didn't know, you know, I mean, I'm going to, I, I, you know, my hand just did it, you know, yeah. and so, and so I, 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 I crept on out, because everybody was, was giving him first aid now, and I went on out the door, and I and I, and I, and I was rushing out the, the door in Lincoln Club. Shore Patrol was rushing in there <laughs> with helmets on and everything. I said the fight's that way, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I went on and minded my own business. But that was that was in uh, New London, Connecticut. Yeah, well, me and my buddy in Malta, um, uh, same situation. You know, this time the white guys were making fun of a brother on our team, one of our group, but he was like a giant. This guy named Gardner from New York City, from Brooklyn, I think, was like uh, six four, six five. Mm -hmm. He's kind of got a shaped like Baby Huey, the cartoon, right? Mm -hmm. And he was jovial. He was a nice guy, mm -hmm. but because he was so big, people felt they could pick on him, right? Mm -hmm. And this guy was powerful. And something happened, and somebody tried to step in the wrong way, and we knew that if he hit somebody, he would hurt him. So mm -hmm. we holding him back, trying to keep him from, you know, doing this. Because mm -hmm. we knew if he did that, people would go mm -hmm. flying. Mm -hmm. Shore Patrol comes in, reaching over our head, trying to hit him with the nightstick, <laughs> right? Yeah. And we fight a, a wedge out of this building and down the street split up. He goes one way with a, a couple of people to get him to the ship. 
without getting, you know, tagged and me and another buddy going another way. And after about a block or two, we say, why are we running? We didn't do nothing. Yeah. And we stopped. And but this time, Shore Patrol catches up with us with the batons drawn, you know, attempting to effect an arrest. And here's how the spirit works, brother. Mm -hmm. I said, We're not running no more. Let's talk about this. And they stop in midair and a speech comes out of nowhere. And it goes back to what my grandpa used to say. Uh, don't worry about what to say. Open your mouth and I'll put the words in your mouth. That's exactly mm -hmm. what happened. And so I just began talking. And it wasn't me talking. The spirit was talking. These guys froze in midair. They didn't kill us. They could have killed us. They didn't do it. They could have beat us badly. They didn't do it. They didn't touch us. And by the time uh, this speech that had to use this moment to reveal itself wound up, I said, that's it. And my, my buddy said, uh, Mac, Mac, keep talking, man. Keep talking. I had no more to say. I had no more to say. By this time, an officer rolled up on these white guys and said, let these guys go. That's how we walked back to the ship. But that's mm. the story. Talk about being a police officer then. Um, we had about five or a few more minutes than that. And I want to get into your career highlights of it as a police officer in St. Paul. And obviously, I don't want to end this show without talking about uh, all the, the power connection that the Carter brand represents. Your son is the mayor of St. Paul. Uh, your wife was a county commissioner for okay. Ramsey County. The first black county commissioner in the state of Minnesota, and and the first uh, uh, chair, mm -hmm. chairperson mm -hmm. of the county board in minute of a uh, of a uh, Ramsey County. So I want to mention all those things as well. But uh, you know, talk about your being a policeman. How did you bring that Navy, that street experience, the things you say? You know, sometimes you're not comfortable talking about. How did all that evolve into you uh, deciding to be a police officer? And what have been the rewards? of your work as a officer of the law in St. Paul? Well, you know, there's a time in, in, in everybody's life when you have to make your decision on who you're going to be and what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and whether people like it or not, whether it, it may not even be consistent with how you lived and what you've done. You know, I mean, I, I, my best friends were, were on the other side of the law. And my, on one side, my best friends were, were Black Panthers on the other side, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I had to make a decision to, as it said, join the oppressor, oppressor and seek change from within. So I put myself on a self-appointed undercover mission to infiltrate policing, mm -hmm. not, not, <laughs> not, to, not, to, not to praise Caesar. Have you ever read the book? Uh, you might know the story, The Spook that Said by the Door. Uh, I know the book. I, I didn't read it, but I know the story. Yeah, well, I gave myself that assignment. Okay. Know, to infiltrate and, and bring about change. Um, and it, it, and so you you had to kind of drink the blue water, you know. Mm -hmm. you, had sip the, you had to kind of sip the blue Kool Aid, you know. And 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 some of it, a lot of it, really made some sense, you know, because mm -hmm. because I was in a position, I positioned myself to to be able to do a whole lot of things for my community that I would not not done otherwise. Um, um, in my mind, I police my city in a way in a in a way that's a community policing. I was one of the one of the one or two officers that actually lived in the city, in the area where I police and patrol. You know, and I raised my kids there. And on a couple of occasions, some bullets would hit my house. One was seemed like it was a retaliation for some a pretty bad guy that I had arrested at one point in time, and um, the bullet wedged about a, a foot and a half from my son's bunk bed. Uh oh, somebody's coming into the door. Uh oh, here, here come. But. But anyway, so we, we had put a house up for sale and decided we we're going to move. But then uh, we decided, no, we're going to stay here and, and make this place what, what the place, keep it the place that nurtured me. The, the thought of me leaving my city to, to whomsoever um, just wasn't just it was was scary for me. You know, I mean, so what and so I felt that, you know, a lot of these cops lived in on the other side of Wisconsin and came from way out. Some guys came drove like hours or so to get to the work mm -hmm. and, and 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 back you know and uh, for me that 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 was an obscenity and so um my house became 
this resource for people because everybody knew where I lived. The mayor, the governor, even back then, you know, all the, you know, everybody just knew where I lived because it was kind of out in a plain view kind of place. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put you. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I told her, but but my house became kind of a uh, a, a holding station, you know, because people knew where I lived. So mothers were bringing me their their kids to talk to and to mm -hmm. and 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 sometimes to arrest, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes um, women would come here fleeing from abusive husbands, and people come here fleeing different kinds of danger and needing different kinds of help. You know, it's oftentimes. Um, we get a phone call in the middle of the night and I wind up going trying to be and so about that same time um um the street gang thing became you know and mm -hmm. came and 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 um mothers trusted me in such a way that I had a level of trust because I grew up with everybody and everybody mm -hmm. you, know, you know I mean we do walk together and we and we and socialize but um um when mothers knew when there's and grandmothers and aunts knew when their nephew and their son had crossed the line or when they were straddling the line. And oftentimes mm -hmm. that's when they would call me. And, or, and, and even when they're about to commit crimes, mothers would call me and let me know. Even when there was about to be a, some shooting, the mothers would call me. And so and both and I get calls from both sides of the of the uh, the gang uh, conflict. Uh, yeah. yeah. And and I go and I go back and forth. A lot of times I could I, I had a softball and a hardball pitch mm -hmm. you know, because look, you guys, they'll stop if you stop. Are you getting word that they'll because oftentimes you know kids don't want to do stuff that they right. that, that they that they're kind of poised to do, and so I'd go back and forth, and so like particularly one time in particular there was supposed to be some shooting up on Central and St Albans. And I told these guys, both sides of the family, you guys, um, I gave them a soft pitch and I said, but if you show up there, I'm going to be there. And when, if you show up, I'm going to presume that you come to commit a crime and I'm going to presume that you are armed. Melvin, let me stop you right there. This is a fascinating conversation. I think it's one that we should continue and explore. I'm enjoying the conversation, but we are, are unfortunately out of time. Oh, today. man, I'm getting wound up. Uh, I'm Al McFarland. This is The Conversation with Al McFarland. My guest, the very special, uh, elegant, and exceptional Melvin Carter Jr. Brother Melvin, thank you so much for taking this time. Uh, I want to remind people to go to the History Theater through this Saturday to check out Diesel Heart. It's his story. It's a great story. It's really our story. And I will see you here tomorrow for The Conversation with Al McFarland. Take care.